Headline uh, stories from The Guardian. And The Guardian reads, uh, Buari orders arrest trial of headsmen with illegal arms. <coughs> That's, uh, of course, it follows with uh, some riders there. Uh, but on the blueprint, uh, of course, uh, the event that happened yesterday in Nasarawa State, you can see a picture story right there. And it's that of President Muhammad Buhari and the Nasarawa State Governor, uh, Alaji Umar Tanku Al Makura, discussing with peoples of uh, a special school during the inauguration of that school in Lafia yesterday. And there you can see uh, the picture of the president with the people there seated at that uh, in what appears to be a round table. And yesterday on this program, we talked about uh, the participation of uh, schools in the you know school feeding uh, program, program right. yes, uh, or, or initiative of the federal government. But again, moving to the story, the headline story, jitters as NAS fixes presidential election last. 200 NGOs who dwell in Abuja insist on Buhari. Let's quickly, let's quickly take on... Uh, well, uh, let's uh, look back on the, what has been described as a black day. Uh, we are having several cases of tanker explosion now, and that was what led to eight deaths on the uh, Ibadan Lagos Expressway. I think uh, more care should be taken, particularly when we are conf uh, uh, conveying inflammable goods, particularly uh, petrol, and also especially... There have been reported cases of this fire at discharge point at filling stations. Right. So there, extra there, there case. There was one ghastly incident that also occurred in, on the Festac uh, Abu Dolphin Bridge. That was yes. late last year in Lagos. Yes. And it had a number of, uh, of uh, properties and goods destroyed. The other sad development is the one in uh, East Secular Road at the end of the Igun Street where a, a driver was accosted and was asked to bring his particulars. In the process, he said his particulars were already in police custody. I think in the, in the milieu, he was pushed and he was knocked off by a truck that was uh, racing. And unfortunately, he died. And that led to the youth uh, rioting in, in Benin City. But meanwhile, the frustration of the governor of Benue State is already manifesting because he's already saying, Governor Autumn is saying to Benue residents, uh, defend yourselves if you are attacked. And it is also coming uh, a day after President Muhammad Buhari, while visiting Nasarawa State, has declared that herdsmen and farmers that have clashed leading to several deaths are to be taken on seriously. All those who are arrested will be prosecuted. And he said specifically that people should refrain from reprisal. He said, I want to assure you, government is working hard day and night for peace to return to the areas. Meanwhile, the nation newspaper has published that 145 suspects have been arrested over the killings in Benue. Out of these 20, 124 have already been charged to court. The paper says, however, that intelligence report provided to the National Assembly linked all these killings to the activities of herdsmen. There's a group they call Shitile Militia in Kasina Ala, livestock guard of Ukum local government area, as well as ag activities of vigilance group and civilian joint task force who are masquerading as uh, uh, social guards. He says, the facts presented to the committee say that the killings in Benue had complications and attendant ethnic undertones. Attacks are traced to headsmen, militia, Shinti militia, ethnic youth groups, arrested gun runners, as well as on trained livestock guard bearing prohibited arms. And the police, according to that report, has <coughs> also made recommendations that there should be dialogue between uh, the, for peaceful coexistence between headsmen and passmen. And they also say that they should revisit the issue of land open grazing established the, uh, without establishing ranches. It, they say that ranches should be established before operating the law. Secondly, thirdly, they said there should be a establishment of what they describe as demarcating cattle rules to avoid clashes with farmers. They said they also need to disarm the livestock guard who are on train and are bearing firearms. I'm raising the ground. Ahead. Well, by the way, well, to thank you. <laughs> well, as I said, uh, we have three t uh, items to uh, discuss in our uh, conversation segment on the program. The issue we're talking about, Benway, law and order throughout okay. the country. That's the most important thing, unless there's a new definition uh, you have for law and order. Thank you, Bayo. See you tomorrow. Thank you for having me. All right. It's good morning, Nigeria. We'll take a short break now. When we return, of course, we'll begin with our conversation. <laughs>
All right, let's begin our conversation with VAIDS. Now, the implementation of the Voluntary Assets and Income Declaration Scheme, known as VAIDS, commenced last year. The scheme encourages voluntary disclosure of previously undisclosed assets and income, and that's for the purpose of payment of all outstanding tax liabilities, and also offered a limited waiver for declaration within the specified period of time. Now, VAIDS is expected to help expand Nigeria's tax base and therefore improve the low tax to gross domestic product GDP ratio. It also aims at uh, curbing the use of tax havens for illicit fund flow and tax avoidance. It is estimated that the scheme will generate approximately one billion US dollars in tax revenues. All right, now uh, here to tell us some more about uh, the implementation of the Voluntary Assets and Income Declaration Scheme. We have with us the Chairman of the Federal Inland Revenue Service, uh, Mr. Babatunde Fowler. Mr. Fowler, pleasure to have you again on Good Morning Nigeria. Good morning, and thank you for having me. All right, so let's begin straight away. Uh, tell us something about uh, VAIDS and how far you've gone. The deadline is supposed to be the March 31st, I believe. So how far have you gone and uh, what are the returns? Well, a lot of individuals are still asking questions. Um, they're meeting with their consultants, and I tell them it's a very simple process. All they have to simply look at is the income they've received over the last six years, income they have not declared, and in terms of doing the computation, basically uh, for the individuals, there's an average of about maybe 20% of the total income, and they have a three-year period to make payments, instrumental payments. So based on the state's revenue agency, they'll enter discussions and they'll give them a time uh, limit to pay. At the federal level, the tax rate is 30%. Um, for income not declared, they equally have to declare it and they'll be given a payment plan if need be. All right. Uh, it's not as straightforward as, <laughs> as, you, have, it is. as you have tried to put it. Uh, yeah. Let's break it down. When you say at the state level and you say at the federal level, are we now talking about personal income tax or are we also yes. talking about corporate income tax or all forms of taxes? What does VAIDS capture? All types of taxes. At the state level, it uh, captures uh, PITA, personal income tax, at the federal level, corporate tax for all taxes. So how, how, how is it doing now? Because uh, uh, as we read earlier on, the, the, the sole purpose is, of course, to uh, increase, generate you know, revenue for, for the country, increase the tax, to, uh, tax returns to the yeah. GDP ratio you know, above 6% that we have now. So how is it doing after almost nine months of uh, implementation? Well, um, if we look at the experience of other countries where it has uh, taken place, people generally wait to the last minute. Um, so like, like I said earlier on, a lot of people have been asking questions, um, have been getting themselves ready, both at the individual and corporate level. And so we believe by the end of February, first week in uh, March, a lot of um, actual uh, conclusions will be made in terms of their transactions with the various states and uh, FIRS. With, 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 with the response so far, do, would you say there was clear wisdom behind the initiative? Definitely. Um, every country that has carried out such an exercise, there were countries that had a low uh, tax compliance rate. They were all successful. And we've got to be mindful that if people do not take advantage of this opportunity, apart from them paying the interest and penalty, we'll also prosecute. So it's an opportunity to just give back to government and to the people of Nigeria what they owe them through tax. What is undeclared income or asset under the VAT scheme? Okay, let me try and break it down. For individuals, for example, um, if you have a property that you rent out and you collect rent, that is part of your income. A lot of landlords have not declared that income, whether it's a property in Nigeria or a property outside Nigeria. Um, a lot of companies are involved in what we call transfer pricing schemes, uh, whereby they'll make income in Nigeria or make profit in Nigeria, and they have maybe a subsidiary in some country that has a lower tax rate. They'll keep the expenses in Nigeria, so there'll be no profits, no tax, and then declare the profits in a country that has a lower tax rate. So we're asking people to come forward and 
regularize? For, for those who are on the pay as you earn uh, tax regime, are they also affected by uh, the VAT scheme? Yes. You see, for those under that scheme, we had found out even during my time in Lagos that some employers deduct that tax and don't remit it to government. So we're looking at those that have deducted and have not remitted to government because every individual who pays tax is entitled to a tax card or a tax clearance certificate. So we're asking everyone who has a job under that scheme, if your employer deducts your tax, request for your tax cert clearance certificate. Um, at the corporate level, you, a lot of people do contracts. They have withholding tax deducted, and the corporate organization does not remit the withholding tax. So uh, is, we're requesting people, we'll be in the media very soon, that if you have your withholding tax deducted, kindly request uh, for evidence to show that it has been remitted. So th there's, there's obviously a, a kind of communication gap, you know, between FRS and, and or the implementers of VAIDS and, and those who are supposed to be within the, 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 the catchment uh, net. So w what form of enlightenment, you know, ha have you undertaken, uh, especially those at, at the rural areas, you know, who also have returns to make? Well, in terms of communication, um, I'll say there's been an improvement of, of recent, but in terms of the operators of VAIDS, uh, which is the Federal Ministry of Finance, FIRS, and all the state um, revenue agencies, we even had a meeting just yesterday with the minister. So we're all on the same page. But in getting the message out, we're sending people out across the nation. Um, we, have the, we have tax volunteers. We have the group that have been employed by the federal government. And we have kiosks in the various airports. And I believe in the month of February, we're going to see uh, a lot more in the media. Why, why do you think, because you mentioned landlords, for instance, mm -hmm. why, why do you think they haven't come forward you know, to uh, uh, take advantage of, of this uh, amnesty? Well, a lot of them have been asking questions. And like I said, it's just natural that um, if you have a debt, you usually would want to wait to the last moment <laughs> to pay that debt. So it's, it's nothing new. And like I said, countries that have gone through this process, also it was the last month that a lot of their... Uh, individuals and also corporate organizations came forward. But at the federal level, <coughs> we've had people pay quite a, a bit of, um, of, of money on VAIDS. We've had over 173 corporate organizations uh, approach us formally um, and with uh, correspondence. So we were, were quite, I won't say hopeful, we're quite sure the, that the, next the, the, week the, rec or two. the recession, you know, hit some, you know, of, I mean, firms and companies in, in the past. Of course, we, we are out of the recession. So there, there, there might be people or outfits, you know, who are owing or who have undisclosed uh, returns to make, but are presently not making, you know, returns. So where do you place them? Well, for those that um, are tight for cash right now, mm -hmm. they have up to three years to pay the outstanding amount. Mm -hmm. So basically, we have information on their operations. We will know whether they truly do not have the financial capacity to pay, and we'll enter dialogue with them. Um, for us as tax people, our job is to ensure that you continue to pay tax. So our job is not to run you out of business, not to make it um, impossible. So if we know that um, you need certain cash to run your business, and you also have to pay your taxes, we'll enter a dialogue. We'll let you have enough cash to run your business, to continue to make profits, and we'll take the tax along the way. I, I would like you to uh, speak further on the uh, issue of the taxpayers' own responsibility. For instance, the pay-as-you-earn uh, scheme. Uh, if the employer has not been making remittances, whose responsibility is that? Is it that of the taxpayer who, for instance, doesn't have a tax clearance certificate? That's one leg. Second leg, you also talked about withholding tax. Uh, you have all forms of uh, uh, schemes where, you, where, where there's withholding tax. For instance, interest on, uh, on a fixed deposit. Uh, it is not the responsibility of the depositor to make such remittance. So uh, where does the liability or the responsibility lie in these two instances? Well, 
officially, legally, it is the responsibility of the organization who has deducted the tax to remit. But when we ask ourselves, why do we pay tax? We pay tax to ensure that government can provide services. So we're also asking the taxpayer to also request for a tax claim certificate. And if you have had your withholding tax deducted, request for evidence to show that it has been remitted. Now, you don't actually have to go to the organization. You can contact us. We can verify within a matter of 24 hours whether that withholding tax has been remitted on your behalf. And withholding tax is an advanced tax. So when you're doing your final returns, you might find out that maybe you've overpaid and you're due for a refund. You know, so basically you are calling all Nigerians, both at the individual level, at the corporate level, to let's join together to make sure that we can fund our respective governments. Because we keep on saying we want better roads, we want more hospitals, we want more schools. Government at the federal level, government at the state level requires funding. So it's a very simple thing. Just request but, uh, for your... Uh, let's still deal with the mechanism uh, for the operation of the, of, of the VATES and indeed the tax system in general. Uh, how, for instance, would a taxpayer distinguish this from various forms of taxes? In Lagos, where you were also uh, in charge of the LROS, the property, for instance, there's the uh, land use charge, which comes with that. Uh, a, a landlord will ask himself, if I paid land use, if I paid land use charge, does that suffice? Uh, again, for making voluntary asset declaration or income declaration of the property, that's one. Two, we have also had instances where some state governments, Lagos for instance, will say, look, uh, the TIN you have, that is a tax identification number, uh, it's not applicable in Lagos. We would need to see what you are paying in Lagos rather than the one from FRS. How have you resolved all of this in the context of seeking to implement VATES and then general tax administration in the country? Well, we're all members of what we call the Joint Tax Board. So we've actually started a consolidation of all taxpayers. Um, before the end of March, um, at the touch of a button, all tax revenue agencies will be able to see the tax uh, position of all individuals and corporate organizations. So for example, uh, Lagos has a tax ID. Um, Ogun State has a different tax ID. So at the end of this quarter, at the touch of a button, if you have a transaction in Ogun State and you reside in Lagos, the um, chairman of Ogun State will be able to see your tax uh, position. Yeah, well, what about the other issue of you know, conflation of, for instance, land use charge with uh, income tax that, you, that you, you are now seeking to drive, capital gains tax, and the various forms of taxes that you have all around? Well, those are different taxes. Yes. Um, the land use charge basically is a tax based on the type of property you have and the use of property. So if you have a property that you rent out and you earn income on that rent, that is taxed to the um, landlord that he has to pay on that income. The land use charge usually between the tenant and the uh, landlord, there's an agreement. In a lot of agreements, they'll say your rent is 100 naira less or net of all other charges. So that means that the tenant will pay the land use charge or pay any other charges. So it all depends on the agreement between the landlord and the tenant. Fernando, what, what, after 31st of March, what happens? Then Any you, 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 you start paying your interest, you start paying your penalty, and then if need be, then we'll prosecute you. All right, uh, Babatunde Fowler, Chairman, Federal Inland Revenue. We thank you very much for coming on our program. Thank you for having me. All right, this is Good Morning Nigeria. Uh, Kingsley, we have... Uh, the next, uh, oh, right, yes, so we're joining our correspondent Salio Adulai for the background report on our conversation relating to the uh, open skies as a single African air transport market. The single African air transport market is a flagship project of the African Union Agenda 2063, an initiative of the African Union to create a single unified air transport market in Africa. 2015, the Assembly of Head of States and Government adopted the declaration of the establishment of a single African air transport market and also issued a commitment to the immediate implementation of the Yamosukuro decisions towards its establishment. It is part of efforts towards liberalizing the civil aviation in Africa as an impetus to the continent's economic integration agenda. 
at the Tatiet AU Summit in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, 25 of the 55 countries seal an agreement to commence the operation of a single air aviation market, also known as African Open Skies. Following the unveiling of the single aviation market, Nigeria, South Africa, and Kenya became the first set of countries to embrace the initiative, which has been in the pipeline for over three decades. Nigeria government, through the Minister of State Aviation, Hadi Sirika, says with the launch of single air aviation market, the federal government will hasten plans to turn around the aviation sector with the plan to unfold a national career. A step which experts hope might revive the country's hope of adding value to air travel through the full commitment of government, not as a spectator, but as active participant in the industry for the good of the citizens. According to Hadi Sirika, the initiative is loaded with several benefits, including increased investment, job creation, among others. However, Airline operators of Nigeria considers this move as unfair and a complete disconnect as they were not carried along in the decision process leading up to the signing of a treaty and firm commitment to the process. In addition to the fact that Nigerian airlines are at a disadvantage to other African airlines that are largely government-owned and heavily subsidized. On the same note, air operators pay about 37 different charges that come under the guise of statutory levies and taxes to sustain staff strength of about 18,000 of the various government agencies compared to most African carriers who pay a fraction in their countries to support a staff strength of less than 500. Shortly on the program, guests will speak further on the advantages and otherwise of the single African airline market to Nigeria when fully domesticated. All right, Saluhu Abdullahi giving us a background report to our discussion. We have three aviation experts joining us for this discussion. Let me quickly welcome uh, here in our Abuja studio, uh, Captain Mohammed Joji. Of course, uh, as I said, uh, he is an aviation expert, Captain Joji. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. All right. We also have uh, two guests uh, seated at the Lagos Network Center. And uh, Chris Aligbe, also uh, an aviation expert. Uh, Mr. Aligbe, thank you very much for joining us. Good morning. Thank you. Iyayi, uh, Captain Roland Iyayi is also uh, in white. Thank you, Captain Iyayi, for joining us. Thank you for having me. We have had Kisley. All right, uh, well, gentlemen, uh, l let's begin a conversation uh, with our guests uh, in Lagos, uh, Captain Roland Eiaye. Let us into what uh, the single African aviation uh, or air transport market uh, is all about. How would the market be like in operation? Uh, thank you very much. Basically, uh, what we have as the single uh, African air transport market is uh, something that's evolved from what we had in 1988 as the Yamasukro uh, Declaration, as it were. Uh, the Yamasukro Declaration uh, evolved uh, over a 10-year period in 1999 to become a Yamasukro decision. Now, essentially, what uh, the African governments were looking at is a way to evolve something akin to the European uh, airspace where you have a single European uh, 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 aviation environment. Now, uh, what that has allowed is a growth, a phenomenal growth uh, in aviation in Europe. Now, unfortunately, um, we need to understand in Europe, this was done between 1993 and 1997 in three stages. And that was done because there was a need to take cognizance of all the different nuances that can come into play uh, to distort the market, as it were. But what we have had in Nigeria and indeed Africa in this particular mm. regard is something that has been foisted on most states. And to a large extent, uh, we have, as usual, a knee-jerk reaction to uh, treaties and policies put in place and we have not taken cognizance of the impact in the longer term on our own domestic market. In Nigeria, uh, we, we haven't taken any cognizance of what has happened since 1984 when we deregulated 
The market was distorted because it became fragmented. And of course, we lost Nigeria Airways. Nigeria Airways at the time was designed to take cogn I mean, to sort of cater for the entire country. But by the time you had other players, you had a fragmented market. In this particular case, uh, Nigerian aviation is at the weakest point you can have it today. When you now have a single African air transport market, what you end up doing is creating even a fertile environment for the decimation of Nigerian domestic carriers. Because they're not prepared for this, uh, we, we have been told in terms of a framework how long the, the, the implementation will take. We've just been told a couple of weeks, I mean about two weeks ago, uh, a week and a half ago rather, that this particular uh, initiative has come to stay. Now, we need to understand there is a, a, a balance here. We have very strong aviation countries in Africa, and I can name about four of them. But these countries have very weak uh, uh, economies to a large extent, or they do not have the size of a market requisite to, to expand and grow. So what would, uh, what would eventually happen is a situation where these countries would tap into the opportunities afforded by this uh, initiative and come into the Nigerian market where we have the largest market base in the entire, in the, in the entire Africa. So in essence, we're looking at a situation where Nigerian carriers that are ill-prepared are not given the opportunity to tap into the, uh, the, the, the initiative. So in the longer term, Nigeria would lose and all the other African countries will gain. So that is essentially where we are at this point. And that's why you would hear that a lot of all the uh, airline operators in Nigeria uh, would say to us, look, this is not right. The initiative is a good initiative, but the timing for Nigeria is wrong. Uh, let's bring in uh, Chris Aligbe, who is also right there uh, beside you in Lagos. Chris, considering the fact that this is an agenda um, that you know was agreed on as far back as uh, you know 1999 in Yamusukru, and out of over 50 African countries, just a few have really uh, showed strong uh, inclination to implementing it. So, what again? <coughs> is the implication, you know, for some of these countries, or African countries, to open up uh, uh, their skies. Thank you very much. Uh, we have seen skies opened elsewhere, and we have seen the tremendous benefit that open skies uh, bring in. And we decided that we should do this. It's over some, almost close to more than three decades when these decisions were taken. But it's a typical thing with us. Nigeria, at the time this was taken, Nigeria Ways was uh, functioning. But thereafter, when uh, uh, the airline was uh, unfortunately liquidated and the other airlines couldn't pick up, then the challenges came in. But the fact of the matter, apart from Nigeria Ways, no domestic airline has ever gone to uh, forums where these decisions are being discussed. Not that they are prevented from going there, but they didn't think it was necessary. No Nigerian airline belongs to AFRA. When we were in AFRA, a lot of discuss discussions of this were always coming in, and we knew what was going on. But when we left AFRA, where Nigeria was, and the other airlines were not there, the bigger boys, like Roland said, continued the discussions because the benefits, they were the benefits were going to accrue to them. But we had so much time to prepare ourselves. But we kept uh, fumbling, wobbling, and fumbling with, the, with respect to the airline subsector. The domestic airlines weak, facing difficult conditions, and the government uh, not, uh, not, not having time to think about them. It's a question of uh, the chicken is weak, uh, the, the, the hawk is merciless. That has been the relationship. But today, we should not cry over spilled milk. The fact of the matter, the train is already moving. How can we join the train? That is also what will happen with some other African countries who didn't sign. But if over 25, if 25 have keyed into it, then we need to, including Nigeria. Nigeria is one of the drivers. We need to get in there. I think that is probably what is in the mind of the Honorable Minister of Aviation talking about the need for urgently put in place a national carrier. But beyond putting in place a national carrier, there's only urgent need to help other domestic 
airlines. And I think we should take a holistic approach to it. The time has come for now to declare the airline industry an infant industry and put in place so many things, benefits that will help the airline industry to grow. If we don't do that, what will we lose will be so tremendous. Even a national carrier, a national carrier might not exploit, be able to exploit all that we should exploit. So along with national carrier, the domestic airlines must be held. But they must come together to put their demand in place. If they don't, to make their request, if they don't, then we have no hope. That's my position for now. All right, uh, Mr. Chris Olibwe, thank you very much. Uh, we'll come back to uh, you gentlemen in the Lagos Network Studios. Let's uh, now bring in Captain Mohamed Georgi. Captain Georgi, uh, uh, let's break this down. What are open skies? Uh, I'm sure a viewer will be asking at home. I mean, are there closed skies? What do, what do you mean when you say open skies? What are the modalities for operating open skies? Yeah, we copy it from Europe. You know, that's uh, in, the, uh, in the European Union, nothing called international. Everything is domestic. You don't need passport, you don't need visa, you don't, you don't need visas, you don't need anything. So this open sky we are going to advocate is that the similar thing that Europe did. That's what we are going to do. It means that... Uh, um, I can go to Addis Ababa, I can go to anywhere, I don't need a visa. All I need is just my passport to go through. With so, regards to air travels, what does the, it mean? Does go, it mean that the, any, any aircraft from Nigeria, any plane from Nigeria can fly into any country? Any yes, other yes, but the problem... Without restrictions? Without restrictions. But we are at a disadvantage because the market is here. If you, um, if you look at the latest stat statistics um, which I have, our population is 191.8 million in Nigeria today. And so you have uh, what you call average 18 years. At the end of the day, the market is here in Nigeria. We are ill-prepared for it. As I as you said, one of the managing directors of Nigerian Airways, we are doing all sort of things to make sure that we are the first airline uh, in Africa. So let's look at the viability of, of, the, of the policy first before we look at you know, our position, you know, Nigeria's position. You know, and and, and uh, an impact on, on, our, on our economy. Yes. What is the viability no, of this no, policy? Um, it, it is a very very good move, but Nigeria, the one that will suffer initially before we get our act right, is good. It's welcome. It's very good. But as I say, the domestic airline are ill prepared. Why? Because of the cost of operating airline in Nigeria is extremely high. You go to the bank, 28 percent interest. Those countries, most of them are national airlines. 5 to 10 percent interest, that's what they do. So, so to us, internally, we have to get our act right before we sign that act. Unfortunately, none of the operators are taking into consideration at all. Fine, they ask the president to sign, they have signed. But the question is, they should have sat down with us as a stakeholder forum to ensure before they sign. This is our problem. For example, VAT. We are the only country so far, in fact, around the world that charges or that charges or that's what you call pay VAT on an airfare. If I can tell you what, what happened the, with the write up we have here on, on the VAT issue, I was in the tax world as such. VAT is never charged on transportation in any part of the world because transportation is the basic service which drives the economy. We at the task, we recommend that the VAT decree 102 1999 specifically schedule 3 and the good exam item 6 which exempt all commercial vehicles and spare apart from VAT, but the airline were not exempted. So we decry that. Uh, so at the same time, also there are what you call um, the multiple taxation, which one of the country um, director, um, Rudy On, he said that Nigeria has the highest operating cost in, in all these issues. So unfortunately, for example, also that uh, in domestic flight, if I'm flying from my degree, I'm going to Ghana. They start charging me dollars right from my degree because I'm going to fly international. In my airspace, you are charging me dollars. So you can cope. Every item of an aircraft, the raw materials, note, bolt screws, we paid in foreign currency. And that, there's no substitute to that. So you see, the internal, so internally we have the biggest problem so far. We have to address those issues before we go and sign this issue. Judy, considering the fact that this is not a new policy, this is a policy that has spanned uh, you know, over two decades, if, 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 if yeah, I'm, not, if I'm yeah. not mistaken, yeah. so what, what does it take or what will it take Nigeria to be prepared or to be ready to key into what you have described as a viable policy? We were not taking into consideration at all. You, if you want to show me a suit, take my measurement <coughs> project. 
That's what happened all along. Policy formulation, policy deviation, policy contradiction. Today, if you look at um, the last flight of Nigeria was 2004. Right from that day to date, the Nigerian aviation is being um, operated um, <laughs> by private airlines. And there's nothing to show for it. We have to look, help us, give us what you call sweat equity. Sweat equity is mean like an umbrella. You come behind me, what do you want? Cheap land, cheap landing, cheap out this. You didn't do that for us. We invested over about three billions of our own resources. And the policy is always suffering from what you call, um, uh, what do you call um, policy somersault? For example, if I'm going to lease an aeroplane, Nigeria doesn't have probably new aeroplane and so on and so forth. So if you have a foreign air, uh, what do you call a foreign registered aircraft, which are good aircraft, well maintained, etc., etc. So what happens? They say, ah, you <coughs> cannot keep that aircraft for more than a year. Deregister it. We don't have the money. When you deregister an aircraft in Nigeria, the value goes down, the insurance goes up. So we are suffering from all these kind of uh, this negative antecedents as far as we are concerned. All right, uh, Captain Georgie, thank you very much. Let's return to uh, our guest in Lagos. Uh, first with uh, Captain Roland Iyai. Captain Roland Iyai, I, I still am, I'm interested in a further explanation of the meaning of open skies and therefore uh, what that also would do to uh, BASA, that's to say the bilateral air services agreements, that we have. How will the open sky policy, open skies policy, operate in, in terms of, you know, uh, passengers, in terms of airlines or airliners and, 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 and all of that? How? Essentially, uh, when you take the European experience, which is basically what the African, uh, uh, the single African air transport market is uh, trying to copy, the European experience, like I said, was evolved in three phases, and this was to take cognizance of all the issues that may arise. Now, all the European countries came together to agree that they needed to have one, what you call an aviation community. So in Europe today, the entire European Union is one aviation community. What that entails when it talks about open skies is that any airline from any European country can actually launch services from their base or even set up bases in any other European country and operate the entire European wide uh, skies without all the re you know, restrictions you would have had with the bilateral agreements. However, what we have with this single African air transport market policy is essentially trying to evolve, but we have not, the, the faces have not been defined. From what I have read, it says, that the bilaterals will, res will remain for a period of time. Now, if bilaterals remain, what you're saying essentially is that Nigeria will still necessarily have to designate the domestic carrier to fly into whatever markets. So invariably, we will not have the same sort of benefits initially as we would have, uh, you know, as say, for instance, they had in Europe. So the open skies policy that we're talking about is one that would essentially allow seamless, unfettered access to any and every market in Africa. That is not the case as we speak. It would evolve over time. That would also lead to the issuance to every African, what you call the African passport, which will mean that you can take that passport and go to any of the 54 countries in Africa without the requirement of a visa for as long as every state in Africa uh, is a signatory to this treaty. At this present time, we have about 23, 25 countries. So essentially, we, we, we're still about halfway to go. Now, those are, the ben those are the things that should actually be in place before we talk about you know, a formal launch. But again, we, we have that launch. Uh, it is not essentially saying that uh, we, um, you know, we, 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 we have all that it takes to get it going. Uh, I can give you an example of part of the problems we would have. Airpiece, for instance, uh, tried to fly into Togo, Lome, uh, recently. It's been designated to go there. But they were not allowed access by the Togolese authorities simply because uh, the aero politics of the matter came into play. Airpiece going into Togo would immediately destabilize Askai and Ethiopian Airways uh, alliance in Togo, but that wasn't allowed. 
And I don't know what the Nigerian authorities did to assist APC in ensuring that this came to play. For that reason, APC has had to sort of, you know, change their program for regional ex you know, expansion. So I do not know if this particular uh, arrangement at this time uh, will be in the longer term interest of Nigeria, even though we have the market size, uh, we have the weak uh, aviation base. Uh, I see everybody else gravitating in this direction. So the open skies in a nutshell should allow unfettered and seamless access to every, and single, every single market in Africa. Uh, that is what he means. But do we have a framework for that based on what I've read? I'm not sure. Uh, Captain, yeah, yeah, thank you very much. There's still another question for uh, Mr. Chris Alibwe. Uh, Mr. Alibwe, you recall on this program when we've been discussing aviation matters, uh, you, you at some point harped on the need for Nigeria to seek to maximize the benefits of its many dormant uh, BASA, that's the many dormant uh, bilateral air services agreement. Uh, how would all of that play out now in light of what we are saying with regard to the open skies, to which you are saying that Nigeria has uh, signed on to? Thank you. The open skies is supposed to or is programmed to eliminate BASA. That's what it should do. If the open sky doesn't eliminate buses, then open sky has no meaning. But I think that's the, that's the projection. And then we have stayed back over time because of our weakness, because there's been a disconnect between the airline sector and the government sector. There's been a disconnect. Otherwise, if both of them were working together, we should not be where we are. The fact of the matter is that we must be very, very active, very, very serious in terms of addressing some of these issues, like uh, Roland uh, mentioned. It happened to Eric, uh, Eric sometime wanting to go to Addis Ababa. He has hell trying to get into that place. So these airlines come into this country, we easily give them access, but they never give us access. And that's the problem. So this is the time for Nigeria to sit down and come with a clear policy. It's going to be a quid pro quo. And if we don't get to that point, these airlines, this country will still be doing what they're doing. Obviously, if FP starts going into Togo, Eska is in trouble. That's the fact. The market will just drop. The same thing with other airlines uh, in Nigeria. If they have this unfettered access, then the huge revenue being made out of Nigeria by Eska, uh, who is really uh, a baby of Ethiopian airline, will not be there. So we are seeing aeropolitics in place. We should, this type of aero policy should be eliminated or Nigeria should get onto the train to play aero politics harder because we have the market and all of them are accessing this market. That's what will happen. But certainly, I say once again, the airline industry we should come together and list out the demands. Some of the demands, uh, some of the things that Captain George said, they are true. Some of the issues that uh, Roland pointed out, they are true. But we will put this as a body of request. When you put this together, the question of custom duties, the question of, uh, the question of taxes. In fact, uh, the industry, FAN, NAMA, and other, they don't exist on payment from Nigerian carriers. It's mainly foreign carriers that they exist on because many Nigerian carriers are weak. Some of them owe, oh, but how much are they? How, what is the size of the operation? That this is the area that you can say, look, for the purposes of uh, a, an airline, in the, uh, for the purposes of uh, infant industry, 50% of the charges should be paid by domestic carriers. Like the judge talking about uh, uh, dollars being charged if you are flying outside the country, it shouldn't be. And then a whole lot has to be done because some countries in West Africa charge higher rates, landing, parking, than we have in other countries. These things are, are supposed to be harmonized completely. But we should take a lead because we have the market. We don't have the airlines now as we are preparing to get a new national carrier and at the same time strengthen, strengthen our domestic carriers. We should take a lead in this aero politics because if we don't start it now, before... If we wait too long, before we now come back to it, it will be too late for us because everything would have been, the scramble for Nigerian market would have been finished. And once the scramble finishes, you cannot get onto anything. That's what we should do. We should be focused, but this industry must be declared for us to go. An infant industry with a body of, uh, 
with a body of benefits, body of uh, this thing, concessions that will last maybe a period of 10 years. You have uh, chapter two, 11 in the U.S. You stay 10 years, if you don't grow and become, not be, and become an adult, if you still remain an infant, it means you are sick. You're a perpetual infant, you can die as that infant. That's what we should do. We should be serious now, otherwise we will lose a lot. The government should tell Central Bank to begin to put together a data on what we are losing from the airline subsector. When that happens, this country will be amazed of why we have not acted. Let me still remain with you. Uh, fr from your contribution so far, you seem sympathetic to uh, this, uh, the, 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 this new policy. But considering the fact that to implement it effectively, you, you, you need a reasonable you know, amount of, uh, of uh, aircraft to, to of, of course, to compete with, with, with other, other countries. With, you know, the, the, the financial status of some of our carriers, ARIC, for instance, is now, you know, being managed by, you know, you know, the government. So how ready are we, Nigeria, to participate in this uh, competition? Uh, well, let me tell you, it's not a question of how ready, how ready we ask this question. If, over the years, YD was not a pull factor to us, today, the accession to uh, single sky should become a push factor. If we did not respond to as a pull factor, we stayed waiting. Today, when this thing has it should become a push factor. And that push factor is getting the industry together. The industry, the government, we are all stakeholders. And it is in, in the interest, not just of the owners of the airlines, of the economy. Because what, what will happen, they will create jobs. What they will put back in terms of taxes, in terms of domestic pro, uh, gross domestic product, will be higher than what it is today. So it's no longer a question of it is me and you. No, it's a question of it is us. And that's, 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 what, I, that's what I'm saying. The, if we don't help the airline subsector, the airline subsector will not grow. Others are national carriers. Ethiopia is a national carrier. In fact, you cannot do anything about Ethiopia in a, <laughs> about Ethiopian airline. It is like a government of its own. It has all those protections and everything. Our airlines have no protection here. They don't have. And there may be, and maybe, if the national carrier comes, because one government owns a property, it begins to dress that property. Maybe in dressing that property, other, other airlines will now see the dress and take part of the dresses. But we should not wait till the national carrier comes before we take steps. But okay, the coming of national carrier is as urgent. I mean, it should have come years before than today. That's my position. Captain George, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Chris Alibe, thank you very much. Let's bring in again Captain George. Captain George, uh, the views that uh, you, the three of you have expressed here would appear to also be in sync with what uh, the airline operators of Nigeria have also indicated. I'm wondering, what is the linkage between key stakeholders and the policy formulators of aviation in this country? And therefore, how did we get into acceding uh, to the open skies without apparently uh, the uh, deep uh, insight from the uh, other stakeholders? You see, um, as, as I said earlier on, they saw us a suit without taking our measurement. They decide on the policy, they come and tell us, this is what you will come for a seminar. Already the bottom line has been written. We've been complaining. I said, look, we are the ones that are pumping our money and suffering from it. They are talking about national career, national career. I operated national career myself. Let me give you just a small background. 15th of May, 1946, resolution 682 of the Buckingham Palace, the father of the Queen of England studied West African Air Transport in Council, Nigeria, Gold Coast then, now Ghana, Sierra Leone and Gambia. We own 68% of the whole lot. The headquarters is Broad Street, if I can remember, 173 Broad Street as the number, and the telephone numbers are three digits of those times, S73. Now, the first year of operation, 1947-1948, we lost about 76,000 pounds. The second operation, 1990, uh, sorry, 19, uh, 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 you know, uh, the second year of operation, we lost about 90,000 pounds. Right from the creation of the Nigerian Airways, up to the time of liquidation, no profit at all. Anybody want to show me a profit, show me the books. I have about 107 files of Nigerian Airways in my, my domain. Gross revenue net profit. KLM, Lufthansa, Savena, Air Lingas, all maintenance, catering, the whole lot of tea. Go to the central bank, they pay. Whatever we generate, we, co we consume. 
to ourselves. So the question is, is national career the answer? No. Because government priority at the moment is uh, education, health, security, and rural development. So what they have to do, what we advise them, go to the capital market, raise funds, start an international airline. Most of these African airlines were national airlines. They don't pay taxes, they don't do anything. But to us here, since the, since the liquidation of Nigerian Airways, everything has been, been done by, um, yeah, you know, by private enterprise. So to us, we are ready to do it, provided we give us the enabling environment. At the moment, there's no enabling environment for people uh, um, to invest. Look at what happened to Eric. Eric had about um, 26 aeroplanes. Average is four years, five years. But because of these issues of policy, etc., etc., Eric has to be overtaken by Amcom. What is Amcom doing at the moment? Amcom is supposed to say, okay, the gentlemen, we are taking it, we want to pump in some capital. Come, let's sit down, all of us. Nothing has been done at the moment. So still we will continue to suffer as if we are infant industry, unless something is done. Unfortunately, we miss the mark at the moment. That's why you have about 28 foreign airlines flying to this country on a weekly basis. Capital flies, millions of millions of dollars. The money you can keep in this country. So at the moment, really we have to sit down, as I say, on and on as Secretary General. I started AON 1986. Imagine how many years, or something years. Nothing has changed so far. And I'm still a Secretary General. We've been crying on and on and on. We say, please, help us. Help us. We are losing money. Well, since for the last 14 years, as I said, who is helping the Nigerian passengers? The private enterprise, isn't it? There's no government ally. Mm. So as such, you know, you see, the, the, sometimes you, you, know, you get headache. You get disturbed. All right, let's, 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 let, let's bring uh, Captain uh, uh, Roland Iyayi also to respond to this uh, question of uh, relationship and collaboration between policy, you know, formulators and, of course, operators. And take also uh, 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 with you the issue of um, uh, uh, the, the latest agreement we've signed with five countries, Algeria, China, State of Qatar, and, of course, Singapore, in terms of viability and market. You know, what, what, what's, 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 uh, what's Nigeria's position? Well, let me quickly address the issue of policy disconnect between uh, the ministry and, of course, uh, the stakeholders. Uh, we need to understand that the Ministry of Aviation, now Ministry of Transportation, you have a subset, Aviation, is manned by people who are not particularly industry experts. They're civil servants. Now, uh, to a large extent, when Nigeria Airways existed, any time there was a forum that required expertise in aviation, uh, a lot of people from Nigeria Airways uh, were part of a, I mean, sort of a, the, uh, the team that went ahead to all these negotiations with the ministry. Unfortunately, after the demise of Nigeria Airways, uh, the ministry took it upon itself to do all of these issues or deal with all these issues on their own. Uh, most of the time, policies are you know, brought to the industry more like a fair company. There is never any policy that has been investigated, no studies done to, to, to sort of uh, determine the impact of any of the study, I mean, the, the policies on the industry before they're actually enacted. So we end up having policies that are written by individuals who haven't bothered to look at the overall impact on the industry and the industry is never carried along, we get things as a fair company. That has been the relationship in the last two, three decades with the ministry and the industry. That needs to be addressed. Uh, if you need to have things to work, like uh, Mr. Uh, Captain Georgie said and uh, Mr. Chris Legby, uh, Libe, you need to have the industry as part of your team to advise on what impact you may have given certain policies. Um, in terms of the bilaterals just signed by Mr. President a couple of uh, days ago, I really do not see anything adverse in terms of those bilaterals. Essentially what it means is that now we can have designated carriers to uh, Algeria, to China, to Qatar, uh, and the, the, uh, the other two countries, and Singapore. I mean, these are major markets that Nigerians uh, already are in, but with the bilaterals signed, 
it would only help to remove the convoluted travel time and uh, arrangements that we need to make to get to these places. And that there's no direct flight between us today and Singapore. Uh, if there was, then a lot of all our uh, traders from the East will not necessarily have to go via the Middle East to get to Singapore. Uh, so the same thing, or Europe rather, the same thing. So we need to have uh, as many bilaterals signed with all the necessary designations uh, done by way of reciprocity. In which case, when you have an airline coming into Nigeria, say Singapore Airlines comes into Nigeria, then we should have a Nigerian carrier to reciprocate that particular bilateral. Otherwise, it becomes lopsided, and then you're going to start talking about capital flight. But unfortunately, we go back to the issue of how strong are the Nigerian carriers today to be able to reciprocate on all these bilaterals. So invariably, because we have this weak aviation industry, it is very difficult to reciprocate on our bilaterals. Uh, even when we've had domestic carriers operate some of the international routes, they have lost money, and they'll continue to lose money because they do not have the same, uh, it's not the same level playing field, uh, I, I mean, they have against the, uh, the, the, the competition from the other side. I mean, take British Airways or Virgin Atlantic, for instance, on the London route. Uh, Medview flies into London, but they fly into Gatwick because they will be told there are no slots at Heathrow. Meanwhile, Nigeria has had 14 slots at Heathrow. What happened? Yes, we understand the grandfather rights, but if the Nigerian government in designating Medview had insisted that, look, British government, you must have a, a, a slot or slots available for the Nigerian carrier as a way of reciprocity, then it would have changed the dynamics a bit. But when we go into Gatwick, what are you doing? Most Nigerians don't want to fly into Gatwick. So already we have this issue. So Nigerian government needs to come to the aid of the Nigerian airlines and play the aero politics the way it is played globally. Not to, we shouldn't play, we shouldn't pay lip service to it. So for me, the, the bilateral signed by Mr. President are welcome, but we need to uh, reciprocate. Uh, in, in terms of uh, the policy issues uh, as formulated by the ministry, there's a huge disconnect between the ministry and the stakeholders, and that has continued unabated. When you go to the parastatals under the ministry, they make you believe it's a, they, they're doing you a favor. That attitude needs to change. We have invested money in the industry as stakeholders. We need to see benefits. I mean, people are losing money simply because policies don't work. So there's a need to appreciate that the stakeholders form a major part and they contribute a major deal to the GDP of this country and they need to be carried along in major decision makings as, I mean, as, as, things, as things are. That's not the case. All right, uh, Captain Iyayi, uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's bring in again uh, Mr. Chris Olegwe. Mr. Chris Olegwe, there is uh, a constitutional requirement uh, for the input of the National Assembly in domesticating treaties. Uh, uh, do you think from your interaction, the observation of occurrences at the National Assembly that there's perhaps sufficient sensitivity to some of the points or all of the issues that you have articulated, you and the other guests have articulated, with regard to the hazards ahead if Nigeria were to uh, fly straight in into the Opus Skies Treaty. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that, uh, yes, the sensitivity there is not as high as it should be. And uh, it's again fault of the, the sector. When really we were, when Nigeria was in operation, some of the conferences were attended. We took people from the legislative arm to go to see, to listen to what is happening so that they will know. If they don't know, if they don't hear other people talk about it, they will think it's just what you're telling them in your own interest. That's why there's also the level of awareness there is pretty low. And so we need, they need the exposure. In fact, the conferences like this, uh, the one that's just finished in Eth Ethiopia, yes, we are a little bit lucky where well, the minister is an aviation person. He understands some of the, la I mean, the language being spoken. But beyond him, like Roland has said, who do you have in the ministry? You don't blame the people in the ministry. Administrative officers, they move from one point to the other. Some of them have managed to stay a little bit longer than that, but their commitment is not the industry. 
I think that it's come to a time where maybe the minister will think of creating a directorate for airlines and put proper airline people in that for the airline subsector because it's become a major, is a major revenue earner, is a major revenue loss to our country. So something just has to happen. And this then, the interaction between the ministry, the airlines, and the legislators, we need to form a better synergy so that at least if they learn, there are so many educated, intelligent people in the legislature, but if you don't put the facts before them, they don't know. They just come for oversight. They come to oversight and they oversight what they want to with regard to the budget and they go away. But the nitty gritty, the policies and whatever that happen, I mean, that should drive the industry, they are not exposed to it. And it is not their fault. Before you can expose people to you, we take them to proper places of exposure. And that's what I think. Even the last uh, Iowa that held in Abuja, a conference of tremendous success. I don't know how many legislators were there, and but that's a place where they should have learned and they should be invited, they should take active part, the aviation committees should have taken active part in listening to the world because it was the world that came to Abuja. And that's what I think we need to rebuild ourselves. We need to see ourselves differently. Like I say, not you and I, it is us. That's what we should do. All right, uh, Mr. Chris Alibwe, uh, aviation consultant, would like to uh, thank you very much uh, for your contribution to our discussion this morning. And our appreciation also to Captain Roland Iyayi, of course, an aviation expert. Gentlemen, thanks a lot uh, for your insight. All right, now back to uh, our Lagos, uh, sorry, back to our Abuja uh, <laughs> headquarters studios, uh, Captain Mohamed Georgi. Mm. Uh, last question for you now. We've heard, you know, over the past uh, couple of years that, oh, there are plans to uh, relaunch the uh, national carrier. Uh, is a national carrier something that we're going to stampede ourselves into now, that we are faced with the open skies? Yes, you've got to be very brief on this. Yes, uh, you see, as I say, no, because what is the priority of government at the moment? Education, health, rural development, security. How much would it cost us? All you have to do, empower the private industry, em em empower them, because the bilateral air services agreement now allow what you call multiple designation. I comply to various parts of the world, two or three or four as I like. But when you look at the Ethiopian airline themselves, most of the passengers they carry, they don't end up in Addis Ababa. 95% mm. traffic beyond. We don't have such connection. We don't have the capacity. We, we don't have the financial where with us. So uh, as it is at the moment, unless the policy is changed, unless the government came to our aid, unless the banking sectors understand, when you go to the bank, my airline, no, 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 that's a floating asset. No, I'm not interested. Or that, oh, because the aeroplane fly and so on and so forth. That, that's a risk because I wouldn't blame them. Remember, there was this, um, what you call the rescue, remember, where they put money in you know, order to help us so the airline becomes so much indebtedness and so on and so forth. So unless we have to readdress that issue. Otherwise, our aviation industry is going to die on our footsteps. There have been various interventions in the aviation industry, Captain Jojo, mm -hmm. but I'd just like to appreciate you uh, for your contribution. No, no, no. Uh, the intervention it has nothing to do with that. It's at the behest of the bank. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, it's at the behest of the, nothing to do with the airline. All the money, the banks collect all their money because they are indebted to you, so they give them the money. Captain Mohamed Jojo, I'm yeah. afraid I have to stop you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Jojo is, of course, an aviation expert. And that does it for our conversation on the single African air transport market. We'll take a short break. We'll be right back. Offense number one. So on Drive. our last topic, and that's the petroleum uh, industry in Nigeria, of course, is considered to be the largest uh, industry and meant to generate an average gross domestic product GDP higher than any other in the West African nation. Now, in spite of the huge financial investment made by the Nigerian government in the oil and gas industry, it has not resulted in significant benefits for most Nigerians. Now, the local content in the industry is still very low. Uh, so over 60 percent, that's the uh, statistics we have, of major activities, including exploration, drilling, production, and other service provision, remain primarily controlled and managed by multinational 
uh, oil companies. Now, only minor contracts have been awarded to local contractors. Now, the sector has continually battled with the challenges of infrastructural development, political stability, good investment climate, project financing, transparency, high educational standards, legal policy resource management, research and development, fiscal policy, environmental policy, and so many others. This story is however about to change. And that's with the two hundred million dollars intervention fund launched by the board of the Nigerian Content Management Board, which is to grow local content capacity in the country. The Executive Secretary of the Board, Mr. Simbi Wabute, said the fund, which was launched as an enabler in year 2017, has a single digit interest rate of 8% for loans extended to the Nigerian oil and gas service providers. A single interest rate of 5% for loans extended to community contractors. It is part of the institution's several strategic initiatives in its bid to dampen local content participation in the oil and gas industry. Already, the board has laid out a very ambitious plan to create over 3,000 jobs in the country, including direct and indirect employment, as part of its 10-year strategic action plan. Hmm. All right, Claire, now we have um, uh, two guests with us here in the studios uh, to throw more light on this particular issue. First, we'd like to uh, welcome the Executive Secretary of the Nigeria Content uh, Development Board, that's uh, Mr. Simbi uh, Wabota. Mr. Wabota, pleasure to have you join us on the program this morning. Thank you very much. Okay, and then we also have with us here the Managing Director, Bank of Industry, uh, that's Mr. Luka uh, Mr. Kwito, a pleasure to have you with us on the program. Thank you. All right, uh, so let's begin with uh, the Executive Secretary of the Nigerian uh, Content and Development uh, Monitoring Board. Of course, uh, the issue was always there that uh, the Nigerian, we, the Nigerian just so don't clear, yes. that the Nigerian, uh, Nigerian companies needed to play a better role, uh, particularly in the oil and gas industry, and this had not been uh, the case. What exactly uh, is playing out now in terms of uh, you know, the operations of, of, of Nigerian uh, local companies it, say, for instance, in the oil and gas industry before we move on to other areas. Yeah. Um, once again, thanks for having me on this program. It's always been an opportunity uh, to be on uh, NTA to perhaps also explain to Nigerians uh, what, what the board has been doing. Uh, like you know, the uh, Nigerian Content Act was enacted in the year 2010. And it's just been seven years uh, since we started operating uh, the act itself. And I can tell you that within that seven-year period, within the oil and gas sector, there has been tremendous achievements in terms of what we've been able to claw back and domicile in country. i give you some bit of statistics. Um, prior to the act itself, the industry spends about $20 billion year on year in its activities uh, in the country. And out of this $20 billion, less than 3% remained in the country. But as I speak today, because of the Act and how the Act has been implemented, we have almost about $5 billion being retained in the country. And the aspiration, like you know, in terms of our 10-year strategic plan, is to have $14 billion out of the $20 billion year-on-year -year spend domiciled in Nigeria. And uh, we are determined to do this. And I'm very optimistic and confident that if we remain focused the way we have been, we'll be able to achieve this feat in no distant future. Just before we bring in the Bank of I Industry, what have been the uh, critical success factors in the climb up of uh, uh, domestic, or shall we say, the local content in the oil and gas industry? Uh, I think one of it is the enactment of the Act itself. It's been very critical to the success that we have achieved up to date. Uh, Prior to now, we implemented what we call policies in terms of local content implementation. And when it was policy, it was on best endeavor basis that uh, the oil and gas industry took on local content implementation. But since the enactment of the act, they know it is law and they have to comply with it. That's one of it. Secondly, I think it's the uh, dexterity and commitment of the Nigerian vendors who are very creative, they want to do things. They have impediments, but the law came, gave them that impetus, and today a lot of them have moved up uh, the ladder. And the other bit again is government focus and believe in the implementation of the act. 
which of course involves our other partners like NMPC, NAPIMS, DPRO and the rest, who believe that it's a law and we must comply with it. So they support it. And I think most importantly is also the legislative arm of government who also believe in the tenets of the Local Content Act and have given their full support in the deployment of the act. So these have been some of the critical success factors. And again, the international oil companies who also believe that local content also bring value to the table in terms of security of supply, in terms of reducing cost at the long run. So all these partners have been together and these are some of the successes we have recorded in the past. All right, let's say, uh, uh, Mr. Luca Peter, you, of course, of uh, BOI. BOI, uh, you know, is the manager of this fund. Um, one, one issue with funds, intervention funds like this, is the fact that access, you know, is usually very cumbersome. So w what are the parameters for accessing this loan? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, like he had said, one of the major impediments you know, for most of the Nigerians who were in the oil and gas sector was that the cost of finance was very high. You know. uh, from studies, some of them were paying as high as about 15% in dollars. You know. And they were paying as high as 26-27% in Naira. You know. So it was difficult for them to compete. Now, we are working in partnership with the board. And we have looked at the sector and come up with the type of facilities that we know are required. You know? And we cover quite a large range. Uh, for instance, there are Nigerians who are involved in manufacturing. Maybe they do pipes and a few other things. Uh, we have a facility for them. You know? They can borrow up to $10 million. You know? And the interest rate on that is 8%. You know? They can borrow in dollars. They can borrow in Naira. You know, either way, you don't pay more than 8%. We also have facilities for asset acquisition. You know, those that need to buy equipment to service contracts for the oil majors. You know, that also, you can access up to $10 million. The interest on that also is 8%, either in Naira or in dollars. Now, <laughs> why we have Naira and dollars is because the contracts in the oil sector usually are in Naira and dollars. Usually, 60 to 65% of the contract sum is in dollars, and some are in Naira. But aside from that, we also have a facility uh, for contract refinancing, you know, those that have short-term contracts. For that, you can access up to $5 million, you know, also at 8%. Then we also look at the issue of, there are people who say, look, this particular fund, we've been waiting for it for quite some time. You know, we had borrowed money. You know, we are paying 20 25%. So if you are trying to help the new people who are coming in. Do you want the old ones to die? So we have said, you know, there is room for refinancing with the permission of the board. You know, for refinancing, you know, you can do up to $2 million, you know, but we don't want to refinance bad loans from the books of the banks that they're just trying to pass on to us. It must be something that is already working, mm -hmm. but the interest is high. But then one of the good aspects of this, uh, the facilities, is that we have something for the local uh, contractors, you know. Yeah, that's what I was asking because there seem to be, you know, two classes of beneficiaries: mm -hmm. community contractors and other contractors. Yes. Yeah. Now, for the local contractors, because we know Those that are the community contractors, community contractors yeah. uh, they can access loans up to twenty million naira because most of the contracts they have is not large. At the same time, to further encourage them, you know, the interest rate on community contractors will not exceed five percent. No. And most of these loans can go up to five years. They have moratorium period between six months, you know, and one year, depending on what type of facility that you have, you know, accessed. You know, so the terms are good. You also ask that people are complaining that the banks don't give money. Uh, like for the, for instance, local uh, contractors scheme that we have, you are able to access that with personal guarantees of the the promoter itself, you know, and maybe people that work in ministries in that state from level 12 and above, or people that work in banks, you know, uh, or manager level, equivalent of, you know, an oil company. So we've made it such that, you know, <coughs> there's access to the funds. Uh, other than personal guarantees, what are the other issues in securitization of these facilities? Now, if you're going to borrow $10 million, you know, 
definitely will not take personal guarantee from you alone. You know, uh, it can come in various forms. Maybe you have stocks, you have shares, you have assets that uh, you know the bank can take a charge on. Uh, you have a bank you are working with; they are willing to guarantee you. You know, so each case is different, but we are flexible. You know, to ensure that these loans actually are accessed by Nigerians. Repayment terms. Repayment terms, like I said, it goes up to about five years. You know, and for the manufacturer's loan, you know, or asset acquisition, you know, you have moratorium of between six months and one year. You know. What, what stories do you have now with regard to repayment for those that have uh, fallen due? Well, we're just starting. You know, we have some uh, applications that we are looking at right. uh, to access the facility. You know, uh, we've taken our time. You know, we have a web page. You can go to www.boi.ng. You know, backslash uh, NCI fund. You know, all the terms are there. You apply online. Because we want to be able to capture every applicant that comes in. Uh, all the things that we require for each facility is clearly stated. Uh, we have frequently asked questions <coughs> and answers you know, that you can access. Uh, and the, uh, one of the new things also is that we say to ourselves, that's our commitment to our partners, that between the time you apply and the time that everything is finalized and we disburse, we have a 45 days, you know, uh, timeline. But that is after you must have submitted all the requirements required to draw down the facility. Mm -hmm. Now, talking about requirements, Mr. Wabuta, I'd I just like to ask you, because you said all applicants, is this the proverbial national cake that is meant for everybody, or is it restrictive to those in oil and gas business? That's one. And what form of collaterals might be required? Okay, uh, uh, thanks for that. I, I think this is a very important question. Um, uh, to ask at this point because a lot of people call me and say is this a grant is this a cake to share no it's not uh, it's strictly business uh, local content itself is not corporate social responsibility it is business it is business because we want to access the activities in the oil and gas industry and so you want to provide service and the service you're providing must meet the desired standard. So, in a nutshell, it is not a grant, it is not a freebie, it is a loan facility that is available to you at single digit interest rate and it can compete with other facilities outside this country. So, you must have the required requirements to be able to access the loan. That's why we are working with our partners, Bank of Industry. We are not a bank. Uh, and we also rely on them to do the credit risk analysis to ensure that whoever they are giving that money to will apply that money in the oil and gas business, will also be able to pay back that loan within uh, the, the period that is granted to the applicant. It is not money to support political activities, no. It is strictly for business uh, applications. So, but. One other caveat, for you to access the fund, you must be a contributor to the fund. Now, it's important to understand that this fund is not a government grant. It is contributed by the contractors who execute business in the oil and gas industry. So that's the difference. So they have contributed this money over time. <clears throat> and people normally ask, why haven't you started this uh, for a long time? Yes, we wanted to be able to accumulate the fund to a sizable figure such that we can satisfy most of the prospective applicants. We tried other strategy on how to deploy this fund, which was the partial guarantee strategy. And we discovered that it was not beneficial to NCDMB or it didn't create a platform to grow the fund further. It was like helping contractors without NCDMB being able to grow the fund. So what we have with Bank of Industry is a 50-50 arrangement. We collect 8% interest, and that 8% interest is divided between Bank of Industry, the guys who take the risk in lending out that money, and NCDMB that also provides the fund. And that 4% that comes to NCDMB goes back to the fund. 
so that you can have more people applying for it. And the other most interesting bit is that we have given this to a development bank. And one of the challenge that we gave to Bank of Industry is that we've given you this seed fund of $200 million. Our expectation is that you will attract other counterpart funds in order to raise this fund to $1 billion mark so that it can go around genuine Nigerian contractors. So if you are not a contributor to the fund, it is difficult for you to access it. But if you are a contributor, you have every right to apply for it so long as you meet the requirement. However, within NCDMB again, we have other intervention projects that fit into the government growth agenda. That if it makes sense, if it is analyzed by our financial advisors and we think it will help the government agenda in terms of the sectors that the government is focusing on, we can intervene in such projects in order to act as a catalyst to get such projects going. So that's a different scheme, which is directly managed by NCDMB. Mm -hmm. But application for this loan with Bank of Industry goes directly to Bank of Industry. There is a web portal, like the MD has said, where people can apply. Very transparent. We see it. There is an interaction between Bank of Industry and NCDMB. If we see applicants, we monitor the number of days so long as they've met the requirements. So it's a real-time thing to check how the bank is managing the fund. Yeah, not if, sorry, before Kinsley comes in. Uh, BOI is synonymous with you know, enabling small-scale uh, industries. So, so why is BOI a choice regulator for this capital-intensive project? A very good question. They're actually not a regulator. They're a development bank and they are also part of government. So this is a, a pilot scheme we are running with BOI. There is also opportunity to look at other commercial banks that will perhaps give the same offering or better offering than BOI. But the idea was to start with a development bank uh, that we are sure that have managed such scheme in the past. Because if you look at all intervention funds in this country, there is intervention fund for agriculture. Mm. There is intervention fund for small and medium enterprise. There is none for the oil and gas sector because people believe that there is money in the oil and gas sector, so why do you need to finance them? But the Nigerian businesses are struggling to take advantage of the Local Content Act because of financing. And this is meant to bridge that gap and support genuine Nigerian businesses that are within the oil and gas sector to grow further and access the single digit uh, loan. Yeah, let me ask you a good, this question, Mr. Wabote. If you take a look at the uh, utilitarian philosophy of behind the Local Content Act, what are we seeing now uh, in terms of economic activity around local content implementation? What are we seeing in terms of job numbers? Mm -hmm. uh, and then what are the prospects in terms of skills and competences? I think that's a very fundamental question. Just to step back a bit, like I said, when we started in 2007, before the Act, only 3% of activities within the oil and gas industry were managed by Nigerians. But since the enactment and implementation of the Act, we've been able to raise that to 28%. And don't forget, the oil and gas sector is highly technical, and it's more of machines than human beings. So the number of employment it generates directly is limited. But the no employment that is generated indirectly through its various supply chain could have a ratio of one to six. So that's where the potential lies. And that's where we want to support. And I think everybody has seen the success that has been achieved in the oil and gas sector. That's why today you have the discussions that we need to extend local content to the construction sector to the ICT sector, to the power sector, because these are sectors that create huge employment uh, <coughs> in itself. Uh, and I'm sure you are aware, just yesterday, the president signed into law, uh, 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 sorry, signed uh, uh, executive, executive order, order uh, in terms of ex expatriate quota management. This we have been managing in the oil and gas sector because the law provides that before you apply for quota to the Federal Ministry of uh, Interior, 
for any quota application, you must have approval from the Nigerian Content Development and Monitoring Board. So with that, we've been able to bring down the expert numbers drastically in the oil and gas sector. But are we there yet? No. Because like I said, it's highly technologically intensive and it is not something, it's not like a light bulb that you just flick at the switch. It takes time. And I have this common maxim that local content is not a sprint. It is a marathon. You must be able to stay within that marathon to achieve the end result. So I sincerely believe that if it is extended to those sectors that have potential to increase, to create jobs, I think we will be in a better place in terms of the impact of the local content law in other sectors. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, do you have a cluster of participants or it's an all commerce affair? I mean, you talked about the executive order number five, uh, which the president signed yesterday. Uh, it, 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 are there engineers, for instance, you know, fabricators, or, or as I said, I mean, I'm, I'm not any of those technical persons. Can I just come in? Are you dealing with clusters of professionals? Are there organizations of cooperatives or otherwise? How, for instance, are the local players getting into uh, this otherwise restricted market? Indeed, uh, there, is, there are indeed clusters of organizations. We have what we call the Nigerian Content Consultative Forum. And this is an enactment of the Act, which have the manufacturing sector, the fabrication sector, the engineering sector, all sectors, including insurance, including banking, are within the Nigerian Content Consultative Forum. And they are the ones who look at what happens within their business fair. And then they advise the board to say these are opportunities within those business fair that you need to intervene in order to take advantage of. Of course, for us in NCDMB, uh, most of us spent 25 years in the oil and gas sector. Like I said, you must rationalize between intervening and sustaining business. So we take that professional view to say, yes, we can intervene now or we can intervene in the next three years when we give opportunity to develop those skills that are required uh, within those sectors. All right, uh, Mr. Mikadi, Peter, your, your final question for, for, for you. Beyond the single, single interest rate, are there other incentives that could attract you know, uh, applicants? Okay, thank you very much. Let me quickly correct an impression. Uh, you asked a question about the uh, Bank of Industry and uh, that the major thing we do is SMEs. Well, uh, I, I said synonymous. Synonymous with SMEs. <laughs> uh, that is true, because as a bank, we are trying to promote SMEs. Uh, but actually, uh, the, the, the facts on the ground uh, uh, doesn't reflect that. Uh, as a bank, our balance sheet is close to 800 billion naira. You know, we're one of the very few success stories in DFIs in Nigeria. We are about 58 years old. Uh, we are rated by Moody's by Fitch and by Augusto. We're a double-A bank. Uh, so we are more than uh, enabled to do that. And um, by the way, most of our loans are not in SMEs. Over 75% of our loans are in large corporates. Most of the big companies that you see in Nigeria today, the industries, we supported them. In fact, I have told our people that going forward in the next couple of months on the BOI things, you're going to be seeing some of the big companies we've been supporting. Uh, but that's uh, just for information. Now, in terms of what we are doing, like I said, you know, if you have the cost of finance at 30 percent, right from the one, you know, it's difficult to compete. Most of the people who are competing against our people, you know, who are coming in from China or other countries, they are coming in from countries where the interest rate is 1 percent and 2 percent. So when our people manufacture here, you know, and they are okay. quoting and competing for jobs, with foreigners, it's difficult to compete because your cost is very high. Finance is 30 percent. You have to add to that the cost of other things, you know, the cost of power, you know, staffing, you know, and all the things we have to bear. So this single-digit <coughs> lending, you know, it's major for our people. Uh, at the same time, we're making it not too difficult for them to be able to access these facilities, you know, and then there's time. All know. right. Mr. Luka Adekwito, Managing Director, Bank of Industry, we'd like to appreciate your being on Good Morning Nigeria today. Thank you very much. We also would like to thank uh, Mr. Simbi Wabota, Executive Secretary, Nigerian Content Development and Monitoring Board. Thank you for being part of our discussion. My pleasure.
All right, so that does it for our three topics on Good Morning Nigeria today. Let's quickly go over now to the Weather Center to check out the weather prospects.